Hey, Tiam Hock, thanks for doing this. Okay. It's an honor and a privilege to talk to you. You are one of those few people that have, um, you started a business, you grew it over a couple of decades. You saw the opening, you sold it, put some money in your bank, put your money in your pocket, and now you're living the life of, you, you, you have the existence now that many entrepreneurs dream of. You built the business, you cashed out, you got money in your pocket, you can now do anything you want, right? So let's start at the start. I know you from Alliance Cosmetics, Silky Girl. Was that the first business that you did? Uh, no. Um, I think the thing started when I was in university, right? Um, when you grew in confidence and you know you can do something. And when you come from a poor family, um, it was never my intention to work for anybody. Even then, really? Yeah, yeah. even then. It started from university days. But, you know, I didn't have money. So I came out and I worked for about two, three years. And then when I got a project, which was selling razor blades, buying razor blades from India, um, and I got my partner, right? This is Mr. Ang from Telling Gardens. And he arranged all the bank facilities for me, and I started trading from there. So from there, we went into uh, more uh, distribution of uh, products. We used to do uh, Fisherman's Friend, Lee and Perrin sauce, HP sauce, that kind of stuff. And then we went and buy a glove factory back in 1987. So when I first started business, I was 24 and a half years old. Right, my first business. I was a one-man show. And then uh, from there, we went and invested in uh, buy over this glove uh, factory, which was household rubber glove. That was in 87. 86, we started another trading company. So 87 that, and then, you know, from there we progressed. Now. So we went through trials and tribulations, you know, send the business good, send the business no good. Um, then went to personal care, toiletries, went to safety products, went to all kinds of stuff. Um, only when it's uh, 1996, you know, after we sold our first company, the trading company, that's where I made my first million. I was age, I was uh, 93, uh, that was 1993. I was uh, 33 years old. My target was to make my first million by, by the time I was 30. So I was three years late. <laughs> That's a strange story, right? But then after that, uh, we were invested in the uh, cosmetic business and that back in 96, you know. Then 97, the crisis came, the currency crisis. Um, then, but then we survived that, and then we took on agencies, you know, Revlon, Red and Wild, many agencies. And then there was 2000 when we took on Revlon. 2005, we started Silky Girl. That's where we really became big, very big, you know. And that is it. The rest is history. No? So, um, you didn't come from a wealthy background, no. but yet you knew you wanted to be your own boss. Yep. How? Those days, you know, you're just gung-ho, right? Because you're nothing, you know. But you need the money, right? You need to pay for expenses. Yeah, right? so my, well, my mom helped we had a single story terrace house in Klang and it was already on a, on a mortgage by MBSB. And then I said, I want to go into business. And my mom says, you know, go and do it, you know. And at the time I was 24 years old, right? So we remortgaged the single story house. And it gave you the seed. Yeah, I, I, I got, I think I got, had a net of 23,000. And that's why I invested in the first company, which was 100,000. I had 23% share. Right. Very gung ho. Yeah, my my mom was the the you know really supportive, right? Why why because 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 this is very unusual, because typically if you are coming from a you know less than wealthy background, you usually try and take the first job you can get, right? Pay for the bills, yeah. just help the family. I worked for two and a half years. Yeah, but you know, I was I was quite good. I mean, I was going out very fast. I was already a manager in two and a half years and uh, earning 2,000 plus at that time and I had a company car. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I wasn't happy. So, you know, I came out and started my own, own So your partner, Mr. Ang from Patali Garden. Patali yeah. Garden is, a, is a quite an yeah, uh, yeah. illustrious company. Yeah. Very old, one of the oldest yeah. public listed companies. Yeah. What do you think he saw in you? Well, my dad worked for him for 30 years, to over 30 years. Right, and he knew me since I was a small boy. And there was a chance meeting because I went to the office to collect salary from my dad. 
after I graduated. And my picture came out in the uh, New Straits Times at that time um, because my grandma, you know, with the uh, small leg, uh, small feet rather, uh, came and, you know, so it was a big issue, a uh, hoo-ha about it and it splash on the papers. So he saw me there and he says, young man, what are you doing, you know? So I said, oh, I'm going to business, right? You know, but uh, oh, just like that. Yeah, and and he said, okay, you know, uh, my friend is trading in this, uh, you know, Islamic clock, you know, right, doing very well. And uh, hey, if you have anything, you come and see me. So when I had this razor blade project, I went and see him. And he says, okay. Very simple. Those days, I was just like, this is the G2. That time was the launch of G2. G2 twin blade is so much. They're selling for so much. I remember four ringgit something for the four blades of five. Did you like G2? Yeah, G2. And then I said, this is from India. You know, this is 23 cents US. Okay, you know. So Don't there was a big now. margin, right? Because Gillette prices everything very high. So, yeah, so we import in and started selling. And then we re- discovered Topaz double H plane, right? It was quite big. So I started importing that also. So first Chinaman to do an Indian, Indian blade. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think are the characteristics that you need to be an entrepreneur? Hmm. I think desire is very important. Uh, desire for what? Desire to be your own, you know, own boss, uh, being an entrepreneur. Those days was much easier. It's not so sophisticated like now, right? Uh, there was much less competition. Um, but there were less products also. So life was much simpler then, right? You just bring in, you sell the wholesalers, sell the distributors, you sell direct to the supermarket chain stores, that kind of stuff. Uh, now it's very complicated. Uh, anybody wants to start a new business has so many options, but so much competition, right? Um, so you don't really, it's not easy. In fact, it's more difficult for entrepreneurs now than before. Right. That doesn't sound so intuitively accurate because now there's so many, there's so much investment capital out there. Seed capital is kind of like much more abundant than 20 years ago. And ideas, that, that's all. That's all people are buying, right? They're buying ideas and they're buying youth. Yeah. So when you say it's harder to be an entrepreneur now, I find that, okay, interesting because you are a died in the world entrepreneur. I'm investing in new businesses, right? Yeah. Uh, I find just because of an idea, right? And you can get financing because there's so much liquidity around. There's so much liquidity. Yeah. So this liquidity are numbers driven. They are not business model driven, right? They think they know what they're investing in. Okay, it's very scalable, blah, blah, crap kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's why you see, you know, nine out of 10 fails. The other guy doesn't know whether he's going to survive or not, you know, right? You look at the track record, you know, it's out in there. And it's because of this VC money uh, that goes for numbers. So they think they have a runway. Instead of being profitable, going for break even and profitable, they just keep expanding because they could spend the money. Yeah. Right? And all hoping for the big sale. Right? But for the big sellout and the valuations and stuff like that. But that's, you know, that's not entrepreneurship, right? Entrepreneurship is like building a viable business, you know? To me, it's a bit old fashioned, but it comes back to the truth because eventually when this bubble bursts, this investment bubble bursts, everybody goes back to, you know, being, basics. yeah, basics, right? You know, it's all, uh, every business has to make money or else you can't survive. Correct. So yeah. ex- expenses are like that, revenues like that, yeah. and that's what you have to make, right? Yeah, yeah. You can't have expenses like that and revenue yeah. like that, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not yeah. the inverse relationship. But there's also this whole idea that um, investment capital has a time frame and there's like a lack of patience or impatience, lah, right? Put in money, I give you three years, you've got to give me an exit within three or four. And there's this idea out there that it's, it's, it's driving people. And, 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 and they, they give you these wild ideas and these wild numbers and, and you're out there, right? You're funding a lot of these ideas. You're using your own personal money as well. Yeah, but I'm very choosy, right? Um, and we, uh, once we invest in it, first thing I do is like, you know, where's the break-even point? When are we going to achieve the break-even point, right? Forget about future investments and everything. Just work on the break-even, achieving the break-even, right? You have to sell. So don't give me all the crap about, you know, all this potential. I, I want to go to the other market and stuff like that. I say, focus on your market, do it well, get your break-even point up, 
you know, and then you know where you are, right? Then from there, if you need more money to invest in other countries, then we go with it, right? But it has to be, it has to be a, first, your home ground has to be a viable business model, right? If it's not even viable in your home ground and you try to expand it, it's, it's sure gone, yep. right? It's a sure gone, so it's a waste of money. So one attribute you must have as an entrepreneur is desire. Desire to be your own boss, desire to try and uh, address a hole in the market, uh, desire to be a millionaire by the time you're 30. Yeah, you, 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 and to be a millionaire, desire. you need to make money, right? The company right. needs to make money, you know? Right. Those days, we don't have such things as valuations and stuff like that, right? Well, we do sell companies, but they come in, they value you at six times, ten times, you know, uh, PAT, right? Profit after tax. Okay, so you sell the company based on profit of the tax. That means it's a very sustainable, profitable company. Yeah. That's why people come and buy you, right? Even Alliance Cosmetics is based on profit of the tax, right? You can say it's EBITDA and all this crap, but it's the consistency of the profits that you make over the years. That's real value. So we get serious buyers to come in. We don't get people who buy us to sell, right? They buy in, you know, they buy the company, then eventually they want to keep it because we've got a very good, viable brand. And it's an income stream. Yeah. It is reliable. Uh, recurring it's income, you know, and with the potential to grow into many markets, that kind of stuff. So desire is one thing? No, well, on the okay. individual side, yeah. desire, you want, I think it's very strong because you, 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 you take a lot of hardship in the first few years, right? Yeah. Right. A lot, all kinds of problems come hitting at you non-stop. You think you've got this covered, but then something else comes up, you know, and and then you find this business ah, hard to make money, the margin's no good, you know, and then you, you're stuck in it, you know, that kind of stuff. So if you don't have the desire to be your own boss, right, uh, to really go into the business. And to suffer the shit that yeah, comes along with yeah, it. Yeah, you, you, you will not be able to take all these setbacks along the way, right? So... Every time there's a setback, then you say, okay, we'll solve this and then, you know, I'll continue, right? And most of the time in the early years, you're out of money. Yeah. You're short of money. Yeah. So if you cannot arrange extra financing from the banks, you need to borrow from your partners, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's, it's very, very tiring, okay? Of course, nowadays, they just go back to their so-called investors and say, this is awesome. my plan and all this crap. Those days, we had no such thing, right? We will sit down and say, um, especially the currency crisis came, right? It yeah. went up to, one US dollar went up to like almost five, 4.8 or five or something like that. And we were saying, I was, we were losing money. When you sell, you lose money. You don't sell, so you lose money. Yeah. Because of your operating costs, right? So we didn't want to retrench people yet. And uh, so it's I talked to my- Silky girl, yeah? Yeah, so I talked to my partner. I said, okay, after borrowing from his, uh, money from him and then we pay off the banks first thing we wanted to do was pay off the banks because the all the bills you know we, we the purchases everything we need to pay off but you know every dollar i sell to guardian you know four months later a bloody exchange rate went up so my cost went up and i was losing money on the sale four months done three four months yeah. ago right so finally i talked to him after borrowing the first tranche everything six seven hundred thousand i remember i said if this by this end of this year, if we don't uh, uh, things don't improve, I will close the company down. Right? No this point. Is, this is country, 19, 1997. Yeah. Asian financial crisis. Asian financial crisis. That's where the first time our currency was under huge attack. Right? It was from two point five went up to almost five. Yeah. Right. And that's when Mahathir stepped in. Yeah. So the then Mahathir in October stepped in with three point eight, fixed it at three point eight. Because I was able to pay off all the bank bills, right, the trade bills and everything, I had a clean facilities to use. I immediately imported. You immediately scaled up? Yeah, I immediately imported goods uh, to sell uh, because the market was empty, yeah. right? And, but a lot of traders at that time, you know, back in 97, 98, all was stuck with all these bank loans and they couldn't pay back and stuff like that. So they could have no money to, to buy, you know. So I was one of the few lucky ones besides the big trading house, right, to be able to continue trading. And within a year, we made back all our losses because the market was very empty of goods. Yeah. So, you know, Guardian, Watsons, whatever, they were just, okay, whatever you have, you know, we'll sell, right? And the consumers were hungry because for many months they were not buying, right? Because nobody knows what's happening. Yeah. In Indonesia, they were quoting by the day. 
I still remember my friends. They were quoting by this. Okay, you will take the stocks in three days time. You know, I will deliver to you in three days time. Uh, it will be at this price. Then they fix the rate. You know, in the bank. And then if it's like one one week later, you buy you know, the supermarket to buy the goods again. He said, okay, I will have to recode you. You know, because it was just going wild. It's crazy. It's driving yeah. all and it's cash. Once I surprise the goods to you, I want to pay in cash because it's rupiah. Right, so then they do that straight away. They they had a conversion ready. They go back and convert, so they don't lose money selling. So resilience is another characteristic. But then you said you had Mr. Ang of Darling Garden, who was your partner, right? No, he's my my father worked for him right. for a long time. But he was the guy who funded your business. Well, he arranged all the bank facilities, huh? yeah. Yeah. So you're solo in the business. Were you the sole owner of the business? No, 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 no. He was the bigger shareholder okay. from the earlier business. You know, I was twenty three percent, right? So he had majority, and then there's somebody else, and then we invest in businesses, and then we arrange bank facilities, lah. So he signed as a guarantor, lah. Right. I so see. I could, I had no problem getting bank facilities, but you still have to trade to be profitable, right? Um, the only after we sold off everything, then the. Oh, another opportunity was available was a cosmetic company. That's where I went back to him. I said, "Hey, this one got good margin, a cosmetic. You know, yeah. the food and all things." I said, "Margin, not very good." So he said, "Okay, uh, okay, let's do it." There's a small company I bought from a Singaporean, and finally he said, "Okay." I said, "How many percent you want?" He said, no, 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 you decide. You are running the company. You how many percent you want, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I say, okay, like fifty-fifty, lah. And that's how we came in, you really? know, on fifty-fifty, yeah. Uh, which is not a good idea. Why? Okay, because yeah, sure I, yeah, later when he passed away, uh, it became a problem, right? Because you know, oh, he shares going go hand over to the wife and stuff like that, right? Yeah. You know, so and the children and stuff like that. So if I cannot work with the wife or the children, then it becomes a problem, yes. right? Uh, so fifty fifty, nothing moves. Okay, so it's not advisable to do what you call fifty fifty. Okay, so principles of entrepreneurship. First of all, partnerships, right? Are you? Are, clearly, you are. You are in favor of having partners, for 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 them to to help in terms of securing facilities, bank facilities, yeah. to give capital for advice. Yeah. But then some people also, um, like, I mean, for example, my own pre- previous business had partners, and that was actually more problematic than advantageous. So Why? Well, in my case, um, we were all around about the same age, all around about the same lack of experience. So there was a lot of quarrels and disagreements. And because we had a consensus of opinion, it wasn't as fast as it should be. No. Well, there, there are a few types of partnership, right? There are a few types of partnership. Yeah. One is you partner with somebody with the cash, yeah. with the facilities, the bank facilities, right? Um, and you run the show. Yeah. He's a silent partner. He just provides all the bank facilities. So things move very along as it is. The the guy has to trust you to, to move uh, to move things along. Then you have what you call a partnership of uh, skills, skill sets, right? You are good in certain things. This guy is good in certain things. This guy is good. and most of the I see most of these businesses are structured along this line, right? Because uh, let's just say even an engineering company. Right, so you 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 are engineer of something, civil structure. This one, this guy is doing something else, you know. So you decide a partner together, and there's a consulting work. Um, so everybody contribute their skills, so to speak. Uh, there's a lot of problems with these kind of uh, situations. If they work very well together, great. If they don't work well together, over a few years, you know, the problems develop. This guy slack doesn't put in his fair share, he wants more money, you know, he wants to have his share of profits, right? and you feel it's not fair because he didn't put in his yeah. work, I brought in all the business. You know, these are very common problems, right, in existing in most of the partnerships. So it's very hard to, if you don't set up what you call a professional setup, you know, in terms of setting, and reward each person accordingly, you know, then you will have an issue. So a lot of it is very basic, right? Okay, you take twenty percent, take twenty percent. I take thirty percent, that kind of stuff, and uh, you are paid this salary, salary, salary. Most of the time, same salary, right? Uh, same problem. You have all kind of problem. Yeah, I work uh, more than you, and my more clever than you, and etc. But there are su- successful partnerships like Caring Pharmacy, right? I heard about five that. pharmacies, yeah. five pharmacies from USM. They started opening their own shops. 
you know. Then they decided to group it together. And up to now, then they list the company. Yeah. They're still working in the company. Yeah. Some, one or two didn't work in the company. You know, one passed away, one didn't, didn't work in the company. They had other trading companies, you know. So up to now, they're still together. Yeah. So you, you can't say that it's, you know. But I would say 70% will have problems, 30% okay. So you would, the preferred model for you for partnerships would be one sole person running the show, operational, right? And then a financial backer as a silent partner. Yeah, or, or people who can contribute but they are not involved in the business. Okay, so there'll be advisors or board of directors. Yeah, let, let's just say like BFM Media. Okay. Right? BFM Media is a, is a great example, right? So Mali as the founding member, all the shareholders do not interfere with the way he runs the operation, right? Yeah. But we are there for him. You know, when you have crises and stuff like that, he can always call on us, right? When he wants to do something else, you know, and different and go in certain directions, he consults us first, right? And then we, we, we work with him, right? Um, so, like this, in a situation like this, uh, it's much easier, yeah. right? Where one person is fully responsible for running something, right. the other partners contribute in other ways. Yeah. Right. Not just money, not just money now. Advice yeah. and strategy and, and yeah. contacts and yeah. sales leads. Contacts. Contacts, right? Um, but then uh, principles of entrepreneurship, control. Some people say you never ever relinquish uh, equity control. You must always maintain majority, 50.1% or more, or much more, preferably. 100%. What do you feel about that? Um, yeah, it really depends on the partnerships that you have, right? I've gone into partnerships uh, with very established companies you know, on my own uh, where none of us want to take majority, right? So we're happy. Uh, okay, you take 35, 35 since you're the two big boys listed companies and I take 30%, yeah. right? But we know we, we need to sit down together to work together and it's not just two person control 65% of the company can make decisions. We will still go back and say, make every sure everybody 100% agreement before we move on, you know. So it, it depends on the maturity of the, the partnership, you know, and the partners involved. Uh, I have, I'm lucky in the sense that I have very experienced people, right. These are probably these people who have long, many long years in the business. So we have a good understanding, like easy to work, you know. So you don't really need to have majority. But like what you're doing, you're talking about startups and stuff yeah. like that, right. Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, because you have to be motivated. So if you are not in control, you know, like Zuckerberg and all this, right? They are in control of the company, right? Despite getting funding in the early years, right? So up to now, at the board level, Zuckerberg still controls the board, right? Google or Apple, whatever, you know, they are all Amazon and all. They are controlling the board. Uh, they might not be having 51%, right? They might not be having 51%, but because through their management contract, right, they could be 30%, but they still have the ma major say in the voting, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's all a play of uh, whether, where is the voting, voting rights come in at the board meetings. And the preferential shares and the... The, 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 the whole the setup. Vote, the vote, vote ratios yeah. and things like yeah. that. But there's a good point on uh, having 51%. Because much sometimes easier, if you raise money, yeah. right, and then you kind of in the process, you keep diluting, keep you keep diluting, diluting, yeah. And then you find yourself one day you're thirty, well, forty percent, I say, right, and then your board owns sixty percent, yeah. And you, I mean, like Steve Jobs, right, yeah. And you lose control, and yeah. you get ousted because the board doesn't agree with your direction. So, your BFM Media example is a good one, but it's an example where things are going well. When things are not going well, that's the, that becomes a problem because they don't agree with how you're going. But theoretically, there have been many examples. And Apple was a famous example. I think so. I mean, if Malay suddenly just goes nuts and start doing stupid things, you like know, tweets or whatever, like Elon yeah. Musk or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? So you you will you will do. And these are all these are investment risks, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Which you can't see on paper, yeah. right? So like Elon Musk, uh, your Uber guy, Travis, yeah. you know. You can see uh, you're always looking at the business model and the valuation going up and everything, you know, a great, a great idea, blah, 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 blah. But that person looks okay, what, right? At that time, he's okay, right? Yeah. Ten years later, five years later, he's, he's just gone nuts, you know. <laughs> right, so. 
Yeah. That that is an investment risk. I think, I don't think you can avoid that. Nah. But yeah. still, when you're in uh, business days, right? Um, some of the biggest challenges. I mean, it takes all your time, right? So did it take a toll on your personal life, on your health? Did it? You know, did you take years and years before you found a woman to marry? Things like that. I mean, there's always a sacrifice, and some of people spend all their time building the business, and everything else suffers. Well, we are old school. We are providers, right? Once you get married, your children, uh, old school way of doing this, we make sure we provide. Yeah. Right. Very important. It's coins we must provide. Provide a home, and then my wife is also working, so we make sure that I get the right mates to come in. You know. Or get the extended family to help look after the children, um, you know, safety, transportation to school, back, you know, tuition, that kind of stuff. So we do participate, but if uh, both of us are out most of the time, then it becomes very difficult. So uh, the wife will slowly have to take a back step a bit from her career, own career, and spend a bit more time in the household stuff, and then I will focus more on the business, right? Um, then you have the weekends, ah. Um, to say that, unless your job entails a lot of traveling, right? There are some jobs that, or some businesses that involves a lot of traveling. Yeah. Uh, then it becomes very difficult. Uh, so if we, for me, I've traveled around Malaysia so many times, right? Because Sabah, Sarawak, we, we have to go into the small towns, market. This, you know, when we visit our sales sales uh, distributors and everything. So, you know, we go to all the small towns and everything. So I've gone around Malaysia many times, right? Um, not the South, Sabah, Sarawak, you know, all the towns. And you can plan, uh, you know what I mean? You don't take up all your time, you know? Um, so I don't think it's taken that kind of toll on the family. Yeah. Uh, it all depends on the person. Yeah. Some guys just don't want to go home. They just want to go for their drinks. Yeah. They want to go have their fun, you know, stuff like that, right? Yeah. And then they blame it all or stress, work, and all those things. I think it all depends on the individual, right? Yeah, but then operationally as well, and you know, running a business is all about problem solving. If it's not this, is that? It's not not that's the motherfucking another, right? So, this guy want to resign. That guy bad mouth this guy. This guy called emergency leave. Actually, he's pontanging. Uh, I don't know. Uh, bank calls up. Receivables not collected. So many things, right? In your line of business, how, what were the main things? So many. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, few management rules. That's what I learned. Yeah. Uh, if I'm the big, I'm the boss in the company. I stop all politics. Okay. It's unavoidable. You're gonna have different camps. They're gonna come to you, cho 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 cho. You look at the other guy come here, cho 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 cho. You know, even the the sales manager will have problem with certain ki- certain of the staff, certain yeah. of the staff, right? And some of these staff have been following me for a long time, so they're like, why are you you know you know doing this kind of stuff and things like that. So first thing you do is you you have to put a stop to it, right? How do you um, regulate politics? It's a big thing. It's a, it can don't believe. The company. Don't believe. Don't believe. See, even when I sold the company, I had to stay back, right? I, because when the first sale to the the private equity side, you know, uh, I sold 80, we sold 80%. Ang family sold out. I sold my 30% and then I stayed at 20%. I was supposed to run the company, right? So I ran the company for two years. Then after that, we got a professional. The CEO became the CEO. My old staff still comes to me, right? So I was still having an office there and everything. And the uh, old staff still can see me. But I said, hey, you know, you please go and see your CEO, right? Yeah. I cannot make any decisions. He's making all the call now. And then when they have their politics and everything, they want to get me involved. Again, I said, no, yeah. you know, go and see the CEO. You know, So you have to consciously stop all these things, right? Because, and, and give your backing to the CEO. Right? For me, it was very easy, you know, but all the staff would listen to me, right? Right, so uh, we just can go and play around, and uh, you know, and the CEO can't do anything about it because I was still a shareholder, yeah. right? I was in the board and everything. So, but you have to let him run the place, you know. He ha- how he manages his politics, that's his problem. How do you legislate against politics in the work fl- workforce itself? And that can be very destructive. <sighs> this guy back mouth this guy, and then they start hating each other, and they can't work together as a team. And then there's a problem because it's business is a people person. It's a people thing. Yeah, um, it's a people uh, industry. 
sometimes if it gets very bad in the department and this person is still of use, you know, um, if the person is uh, really having problems, it's not because of not working hard. The person still works hard but cannot get along with this. Then we try to, I always try to find him a place in another, another department where he can still contribute. That's the first thing I try to do. If the person is still stubborn and still cause trouble in other places, then then he's the problem, right? So eventually he will he will have to go, la, You know, I mean, they can only help so much, but they have to help themselves, you know. Um, and politics is uh, if the person this person plays politics all the time, he will play politics non-stop on. So he's a main problem, you know. So you got to eliminate the problem. Yeah. Right. Uh, so there are some tough choices you have to make, la, you know, at times uh, to stop all these things. Um, the other way is on the positive side is always go on group incentives, you know, so that everybody has to contribute to hit the incentive. Yeah. Uh, th I think that's a more positive approach. La. The other one is a solving problem approach, right, where you get move people around or you eliminate certain people who's causing all the trouble. Yeah. Right. The other one is you motivate them. So if you have a good motivational program or incentive program, everything, you find the team coming together much better. So management rules, politics is one thing. Yeah. And then some people are not born managers. Yeah. Some people hate management because yeah. human, yeah. You know, hu people are yeah. strange creatures and it's very tiring, very stressful to deal with individual problems yeah. and all. What are your rules for those? Uh, I have uh, picking stuff, old Chinese lady who I want to bring become make her a supervisor, she doesn't want. Because she doesn't know how to manage people, she said. Doesn't so I'm just happy people. as he is. Yeah. Yeah. So I leave her there, happy as you are, I leave her there as she is. Same thing with some sales supervisors or sales managers or something like that. Where you want them to do more things than she says, no, no, no. You know? Uh, the other one is, of course, sometimes it entails traveling, right? So you become a regional sales manager. Uh, you have to travel non-stop, right? So some lady says, no, like, it's too tough for me. You know, I've still got my children at home. So we adjust, nah, you know? Okay, then you don't, don't do the regional stuff, you do this, you know? That kind of thing. Nah. Uh, so you have to adjust to individual needs and everything. And as long as they're happy, right, and they're contributing, right, uh, the only problem is doing the same job over 20 years and you keep increasing the salary, then the productivity is not there, right? Yeah. Because, you know, versus contribution. So within their job, they have to contribute more. Yeah. So if it's like sales, you used to do uh, 50000 a month, then you have to do 200000 a month, you know, 20 years later or 15 years later, right? You've got to contribute 200000 or 250000 a month, you know? Then then you have a, a bigger territory and because you're experienced, you can sell, you should, you know, it's always a percentage of sales, right? Your cost is a percentage of sales, you know, something like that. Yeah, but what about managing people yourself? Uh, you know, I know a lot of people who who do run businesses, but um, it's a constant challenge for them to manage their people. Yeah. Uh, and some of them, they try and sh they, they they shun it. They they, they 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 try and not do as much of it as they can. And I used to train my salespeople and uh, how do you handle customers, right? And Prove to them that it's seventy percent listening, yeah. thirty percent, right, thirty percent uh, um, uh, uh, talking, selling. If you don't know what they want, what the hell? You know what do you sell to them, right? You yeah. don't know what to sell to them. Yeah. You just blow it up, and then you just no, no, no. I'm, this is not what I want, right? So you lost the chance to sell. Yeah. So same thing as management. I always believe that the. Uh, you must have the ability to sit down and listen. You know, uh, it's very strange, but you listen to them first, right? And you'll be surprised at how much they will come down from their position yeah. to talk to you. You know, and only when you know what's the real problem behind this and that, that kind of stuff, then only you can come in and and talk to them. La. Same yeah. thing, la. Yeah. Uh, Mine was like ninety-five percent women, right? So. They come to my room, start complaining and, uh, you know, very angry and start crying and everything. So I just sit there and listen first, you know, and tissue box, you know, give them tissue. <laughs> uh, and then when they come down, then we sit down and, okay, 
So this is your problem and everything. Yeah, okay, lah, you know. You can solve this way, you can solve that way, right? And not so bad, you know. And then you explain to them a bit. And they say, okay, uh, it's lighter. They feel lighter, yeah. you know. So one of the ways of like communicating with people is listen to them first, yeah. right? There are some who are very stubborn, right? But you see, keep insisting that they want to do certain things yeah. their way, they kind of stuff. And those are the hardcore, you know, that takes you a bit more time yeah. to break them, you know, to break it down kind of thing and reconstruct again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But your workforce, you say, was 90% women. That's yeah. unusual. So be, even back in those days, you were way more than the 30%, 50% rule. Um, Cosmetic they, business. Yes. Did that bring about any, any you know, problems in terms of managing a particular... Uh, uh, gender, more emotional, maybe right? No, in fact, I find that the women uh, are more suitable to a cosmetic business than men because they understand the product. You know, because no, it's not the understanding because they are very detailed, and it's a very detailed business, right? Every month you're launching a new product, you're doing the same damn thing over and over again, right? Uh, pre packs, display, you know, advertising, magazine ads, you know. Every month you're doing the same thing over and over again. And then you still have to manage your existing business, right? And it's a long list, right? A lot of products. So the ladies are much more detailed, much more patient and much more detailed compared to the guys. I find guys tend to be more, oh, I wonder, the, the overview, the big picture and stuff like that. And the ladies are the ones who go and do all the detail. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're actually much better. Much better. Yeah. And they have a better, how would say that? Better... They can suffer more than men. Yeah. Yeah. When they have a lot of problems thrown at them and everything, they can multitask. That's where guys do fail. Honestly, you know, I, I find that uh, to be a. I'm going to be attending this gender, gender equality talk next week. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, step management rules. Um, growth for growth's sake. Or would you, are you one of those entrepreneurs that um, are happy with the, I mean, I know some people, right, they, are, they could be architects or landscape designers or professional services firms. They're happy with the business where it's five, ten people, you know, revenues a certain level, profits are sort of very healthy, and that's it, they don't go any, any bigger. Are you, the, are you, what do you think of those models? I think it depends on your desire, right? As an entrepreneur, right? Yeah, yeah. as an entrepreneur, it depends on your desire, right? Uh, some people are happy where they are, where they have achieved certain things in life, and because of their business, it's also very limited, right? To do more, you have to take more risks, right? Going to different markets and stuff like that. And also, there's a sacrifice in the personal time as well. Uh, well, yeah, I think personal time is, you know, is is debatable. Yeah. Okay, I'm. I think it's more debatable, yeah. right? I think it's more the difficulty of the business, like if you want to expand, then you want to take on more risk and stuff like that. So it depends on your desire, how far, how, how much bigger you want to go, yeah. how far you want to grow. I think that's a more uh, important thing. Uh, some people are happy, right? I'm making a million net a year, you know? I'm having a comfortable life, right? So you know, not too much trouble. I have a few big clients that I keep doing, like say architect. Right, they as long as they have a few big clients every year, you know, development projects, they are they are on their fees and everything, they are comfortable. So they work out in such a way that they have a good life, they can go and play golf, you know, they you know, take a family for holidays, that kind of stuff. So some people have the desire to be that that kind of happy. Some people are I want to go bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? Times three deal, right? Yeah. From SP Satya he comes out, why the hell he wants to do eco world and then but once he do it it's big, yeah. or else you won't do, yeah. you know. That's the ambition, that's the desire, right? Yeah. right. So it all depends on the person. Yeah. As an investor then, um, what do you look for? What kind of businesses do you look for? And in fact, is businesses the only thing that you invest in, or do you do other things as well? Primarily, I mean, when you talk about investing now, it's more for the children, okay. for the family, for the children. So uh, then they will have a fi existing business. None of my children is interested. So that they will be financially comfortable. Well, I, they are already financially comfortable, right? You know, when I go, they are already financially comfortable. Yeah. But then they wa they want to do things that they like. So you know, so if we invest in businesses where they like, 
right? My eldest one is now in Malay in the online life insurance, right? So he finds that exciting, da 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 da. I say, okay, you know, we go, right? And then let them let them go and uh, work on it. Um, so we invest in businesses that uh, the children will eventually have an interest to be involved or take over or to, oh, to manage. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, that's more like yeah. Um, and then what kind of so 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 your investment in your business investment, your private equity like if you like, right, is really to businesses that were uh, for your children, not so much for returns or. Well, it must be with returns. Like it's a normal, you know, has to be a viable business model, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we invest, right? This is our core, core, core analysis, right? Um, but the 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 thing is like, yeah, I'd like to do certain things, but I go and invest, and it's like, you know, how many more years am I going to live, right? Yeah. Then they have to go and manage these people. Yeah. So, just to give an idea, I I think manufacturing is the future. You think so? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the middleman job business is going to be dead, right? So it's going to be direct from uh, manufacturer to consumers, yeah. or at the most via e-commerce platform to consumers, right? Or to a through a retailer to consumers, or a hybrid of retailers and uh, e-commerce. The middleman is dead, okay? Because there's no margin left, yeah. right? So all this internet. Uh, e-commerce thing is just bringing the prices of products down yeah. across the world yeah. and the manufacturers is a cost plus business right whereas the retail price is uh, cost down right it goes down right so you're having a compression right so the middleman cannot survive the platform people the retailers will still be there because they are the marketplace uh, the middle guys, you know, the like Silky Girl, or you know, if, unless you become such a big brand like Silky Girl or Maybelline, right? If you're just like trying to do a a startup kind of brand, you know, you will never survive. Yeah. Right. And the the manufacturers will then start doing the branding, start going into the going to the market directly themselves. Okay. So if you want to start a business now, yeah, knowing what you do now, what what would you start? Three ideas. Three ideas for the budding entrepreneur. Depending on my desire, yeah. right, on the desire and your so-called expertise, um, I would go for um, uh, uh, one that is a, has a large market base already existing, right? So the other thing is, of course, the, this large market base has to have sufficient margin for you to disrupt, Yeah. okay? Because you know, for once you go into disrupt, the margin is going to drop, right? So is there enough for you? But it's a large base, right? Like taxi business, right? Taxi business is big, right? In, in Malaysia, it's like two billion ringgit or one billion ringgit a year on taxi fares. So it's easy for Uber and uh, Grab to come in to replace these people, right? Uh, so the margin was good because they had the taxi syndicates controlling the taxi rental, right? And then the, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, so they could take over that role, right? Because no cars are required. Ma. So they can go lower price, right? Compared to the existing taxis. And with the navigational positioning, they could go to the customers better, right? Mm. So they improve services at the, at the lower price point. I think you have a good chance. Okay, so, so the size of the market is one thing. Size of the market is one thing. Uh, second thing, uh, because that, that depends on your desire. La, you know? A lot of people go into this business and then uh, say selling flowers, right? It's how big is the market? Yeah, flower sales, right? How much it's occasional, yeah, 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 for occasions, right? So how, how big is the flower market? You know? So you learn to operate within that size. La. So if, you are, if it's a one billion market size, then you can plan for uh, you know, 10%. If it's a 50 million market size, Right, you plan for ten percent of that, You know what I mean? Something viable. Then you know how to fix your business model to cater for the five million dollar business, right? Yeah. Instead of thinking so big and asking for, why do you need three million for? Oh, I want to expand to Vietnam. I want to expand to uh, Singapore. I'm like, hey, how much is your sales locally? You know, that that kind of thinking, yeah, yeah. right? So, so it's, the second thing is like, uh, once you identify the market that you think you can do well. Understand it, what's the size, right? And then from there, you plan accordingly your cost structure, you know? 
a lot of people just put some numbers in, you mm. know, right? Doesn't make sense. Um, I think margins is. Uh, I always look at the, the business model and the, the vertical, right? And I look at the trends, you know. So let's just say a retail, retail uh, FMCG business. You're talking about product right here, and then you go down, you know, it's the retailers, right? And then you go down, it's the wholesaler. Then you go down, it's the distributor, and then you go down, it's the factory, right? Uh, who's who's earning what margin at this stage, this stage, right? So co for cosmetic. When I went in 20 years ago, um, the key was I was studying L'Oreal and uh, Estee Lauder, right? And I was like, sales, their gross margin was 70%. Holy shit. Yeah, that's the, that's the business model, right? I, and I explained to you why. And then, because they spend 20% on advertising and promotions and all kinds of stuff, yeah. right? Merchandising counters, you know, advertising, everything. So they spend 20% of that. Then they spend on girls. Then product development, you know, well, they still make 15% net at the end of the day. But that's because they have 70% 70, 70 but they spend 55%. Okay, so from cost price to uh, yeah. rent price, la, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so you have, you have, you have uh, let's just say you sell to a supermarket, uh, sell to say Guardian, uh, those days you sell to Guardian 100, right? And then your cost price will be 30. As the manufacturer? La. Well, no, you buy from the, yeah, you buy from the manufacturer at 30. Or you buy from the manufacturer. So even then, you silk. Well, I thought you were producing silky go. Yeah. You're manufacturing silky go. So you were a manufacturer. I don't. I'm not a manufacturer. So I buy from the manufacturer at thirty. And then you brand that silky go. Yeah. You branded silky go. Yeah. And okay. I brand silky go, and I have a selling price. I have a seventy percent margin. Right. Gross right, margin. Right, right. So what would be an appropriate business to get into now? Size of market being good, margin being healthy, um, good trajectory, good trends. Yeah. And you like manufacturing, I understand that. Because now because, because the middleman now, so so when I look at my vertical, my industry vertical, right, this seventy percent margin is gonna go like this, right? Yeah. Because so my manufacturer when I said thirty, hardly making money. It's, you know, if I'm lucky if I make five percent net. Yeah. Right? So I wanna go and sell forty, fifty. Yeah. Right? So who suffers? The the, the so brand owner suffers, right? So the brand owner was then have to take a lower margin. The retailer and the commerce, uh, e-commerce uh, marketplace, they won't take lesser margins, right? And then to be competitive, actually the consumer price going down from 100, you know, gone down to 80 or something like that, right? So it's even more complex margin. Right? So where's the future, right? Who controls? I control, the one who controls the supply, right? Yeah. Right? So and the, sub, the one who controls supply must learn how to now play the branded game to take over the middle margin. Yeah. yeah. That, that to me is the future. And that's the game. Yeah, Social that's the media, game. branding, internet. Yeah. 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 And it's no more smart people like you going in and says, I'll take this role and I know where to source and everything. Yeah. Because the factory, the manufacturers are smart enough, smarter than you, yeah. right? And I employ all these people and then I'm, I employ a brand manager, I employ a sales manager, everything, and I go straight to straight Watson's to and Guardian. Yeah, yeah, straight yeah, to the yeah, consumer. Yeah. <coughs> what else do you invest in other than businesses? <laughs> I think like properties, eh, normal okay. stuff. Like. But the main, your main love is, is private equity, right? Not private businesses? I don't know. Uh, it's now getting a good mix of uh, 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 properties, uh, investments, and cash yeah. for the family. Right? Yeah. You know my medical condition, so you don't know when, how long I'm going to last. But so by the time, when the time I go, they will have a nice mix of uh, 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 different classes of assets. Uh, yeah. Right. So there's a school of thought, and I mean, including people like Warren Buffett, who have been very public and very vocal about not leaving too much for their children because they feel, he feels, that it might um, disrupt their aptitude, make them a little bit complacent, all kinds of things. Like. And we've grown up around people like that, been around people who are trust affarians and who are only waiting for their parents to disappear and, and then to live the life of peace. We know the Chinese rule, three generations. First generation makes it, second generation still hardworking, Third generation, fritters it all away. Um, 
I'm a bit old fashioned, but at the same time, uh, I wouldn't place too much of so called joint account or joint holdings for, say, three children to fight over. Yeah. Right? Each already very comfortable. That means they're given this and that already. They're given this and that already. They're given this and that already. So they know all this already? Yeah, they already know. How old were they when they knew? Last few years, uh, since I. Uh, okay. You know. Okay, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But 18, 16, 21, how old is... You know, because if they're told too early, then it disrupts their mental state. As in, oh, well, okay, I'm going to be sorted. I don't have to work so hard. You know what I mean by that, right? So how, how old were they? 18, 21, 25? Yeah, maybe, maybe about 20, 22, 23. Yeah? Yeah. And, but you also, you also analyze them, right? They're, they're mature enough, they realize... And they were able to deal They will with never it. be mature enough, right? You know, so yeah. because they will have to go out and find out the hard way, a lot yeah, of things that yeah. things don't work. School of hard knocks uh, is sometimes the most yeah. effective school. But when you give them when you give them money now, so I don't give them uh, the total amount, right? So I but let's just say I buy bonds for them. Right? And you get a six percent yield, right, coupon. I, I let them spend the six percent coupon. That goes to your bank account. The rest is not given to you yet. But you know you can get six percent from this investment, right? Mm. So if you need to spend more than what you're earning now, right? You have your six percent coupon to spend. Yeah, yeah. Like that. Okay. So you, you, in a way, you don't give them everything now, but you know it's there. And then and they know just, it's there. They yeah. know it's there. Yeah. So you just arrange uh, some side income for them, so to speak. You know, rental from properties, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you have to manage. Then they have to learn to manage income tax and everything. You know. So while I'm around, he can still guide you, right? Yeah. Uh, so. So your condition. Mm. You got the big C. Yeah. Uh, five years already. Yeah. And when colorectal you got, stage four. Yeah. Colorectal stage four, five years ago. Yeah. Normally, then, normally people, most people last three. Three years. Yeah. No In more certain than three cases, years. less than a year. Yeah. Five percent more than five years. So co colorectal is the yeah. one of the more virulent ones. Yeah. I'm um, just a statistic. How old were you when you, when you were diagnosed? I'm 59 now, so 53, 54. Very young. Yeah. How did you feel at the time? <laughs> a shock, huge shock, clearly. Yeah. But you know, the what to do? Right? You know, most of the people, when you discover, it's always a thing. But the, it's uh, how you approach it. Uh. So for me, it was like you kill the cancer cells before it kills you, right? So you went for chemo? Well, it's a multi, they call it multidisciplinary approach now, where you have surgery, radiotherapy, and then you have chemo. So the best is always to do a combination. Yeah. So the first thing is, you can cut it off, you cut it off. Rule of the game is, you can cut it off, you cut it off. Get it off. Yeah, get it off. So the cologne was cut, take out everything, right? Then you can kill it, you kill it. So you can go for radiotherapy, right? Which is that the fella? Lah. Yeah, go and burn it. Lah. Basically, primarily you burn it. Lah. So I did 18 times in four years, four and a half years. Um, so you just kill it, and after that, you do your chemo. So already killed there, but the chemo is just to make sure that but it keeps coming out. So yeah. chemo is supposed to keep it down. So I've been doing that over the last five years. Huh? Oh, not bad, good control. Uh, still coming out, one here, one there, that kind of stuff. But uh, so in between, I do a bit of chemo, I go for my ablation, you know, and try not to do too much chemo because, you know, normally cancer don't kill you. It's when you get very weak, your immune system is down a lot, right? That's why it kills you. Then you start yeah. getting different sickness. So I have a feeling that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people, they, they're very weak from this cancer thing. Uh, they don't, they're not, uh, they not protective enough of the immunity system, right? So I'm very conscious of the immunity system. Yeah. So I don't care, I eat. You know, you yeah. got to get your strength, you know, you got to feel good, you know. Uh, not enough blood, thick steak, you know, right? You know, when you're doing chemo, your red blood count goes down, you know. So you wipe yeah. steak? Yeah, we we'll took away, you know, Hong Kong oncologists will tell you, go eat steak, you know. So if not, you can't do chemo. Yeah. 
So, well, did were there, did you have a lot of soul searching when you were diagnosed? Did it change your, the way you looked at life? Did you analyze shit? What did I do wrong? You know, was it stress? I never look back. Uh. Yeah. Even in business, I never look back. Never look back. Done already. You've gone. You know, what's it, what can you do? Yeah. Right. So you lost the deal. You analyze. So, okay. Well, I should have yeah. done this. I should have done that. Right. right. But you know, gone already. Uh. So next time, uh. <laughs> There's no next time for this. Yeah. <laughs> did you change ex- existentially? Did you did it change your outlook on life? Did it soften you up a little bit? Did you become more spiritual? No, not yeah. spiritual. Uh, but you start thinking more about family. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. But and you plan for them. Sorting them. Yeah. 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 What happens to them when you're yeah. gone, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. So you try to do it, uh, you know, and try to train them a bit more, uh, how to handle things. Uh. Yeah. Spend more time with them, give them advice. Yeah, in a way. Yeah. Top three advice, top three advice for children, father, you know, father to children. Top three things, top four mm. things, top five things. I know, first thing I tell them is uh, productivity. You must be productive. Work hard. Yeah, well, how hard you work, you know, depends on you, right? But but you have to be productive, you know? I say, I don't care whether you work for people or you have your own business, but you must be productive. You must contribute towards the economy, right? Why? Why do you say that? Why is that a rule for because you? Because if you are rich already, you feel you, are, you have enough money, you don't want to work, you know what I mean? So I want you to continue working, to be productive, to contribute to, us, to the economy. Don't be complacent. Wherever you are, wherever you are, right? Okay. Yeah, don't be complacent, you know, and do your best, right? Even, even you're working for people, you have a lot of money in your bank, but you work for people, you make sure you do your best yeah. and do a good job, you know, right? So be productive. Be productive. Second thing, don't need to fight, lah. you know? We see so many families fighting, right? Siblings fighting and everything. I say you all have enough money, right? I will make sure that all of you have enough money. Don't need to fight, right? And don't get your in-laws, uh, your your spouse involved. Any family issues, three of you sit down, sort it out, yeah. agree and move, right? Um, so no fighting. You know? No fighting, number and, two. And the way you distribute, there's still that, that the... The family group kind of thingy, and that's where they make decisions. The rest are all on their own already, you know. So, some families don't distribute. Keep everything under holding. Yeah. That's where the fight starts. That's like a family trust company that everybody gets an income or that, yeah. right? Yeah. And you know, some, of, some of them business also, they don't distribute, right? So, they keep the money, they keep everything inside this holding company. And they're all happy, I give a dividend. Oh, they're not happy. Mm. Right? you got to carve out certain things for them really they feel very so- secure and then there's still the company there okay you know these are extra you know if not they'll fight yeah i think the the thing is uh, to to uh, probably look after your mother right uh, you know if your children you when you grow old you'd like to have your children look after you a bit right yeah, yeah. instead of sending you to old folks home yeah take care of her yeah. <laughs> she's a mom yeah the, those are the three advice to them. Nothing so much about uh, the rest are operational stuff, like you know. Operational stuff. Yeah, you know, banking, you know, yeah, the yeah. kind of things, right? Like. Okay, man. Okay. It's a huge honor. I think there's a lot of lessons for the young people. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>